Hello everyone and welcome to this Global Fleet Champions Spotlight session on health, well-being and the link to safe driving, kindly sponsored by Fleet Coach. If you're new to our webinars and spotlight sessions, Global Fleet Champions is a partnership campaign administered by Brake, the road safety charity, to prevent deaths, injuries and pollution caused by vehicles driven for work. And to learn more about the work that we do and to access fleet safety resources and more events, please visit globalfleetchampions.org. Our spotlight session today looks at driver health and well-being, and we've got some fantastic speakers who will be discussing some of the latest research in this space and how um, the health, well-being and workplace culture links to safe driving, along with some tips for building a positive work culture. So a huge thank you to the sponsor of today's session, Fleet Coach, for their support of this event and also our work. We couldn't run uh, our webinars and other events without the support of our sponsors like Fleet Coach. So on to today's speakers. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Robert Isler, Associate Professor of Applied Cognitive Psychology at the University of Waikato, and Nardine Isler, a Learning and Content Expert at Fleet Coach. Perfect. Kia ora everyone. Uh, yeah, so as Caroline said, my name is Nadine Isler, and um, I'm here with Robert Isler today. Yeah, uh, kia ora everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, thanks for listening. Uh, it's wonderful. So just just by way of introduction to add to what Caroline said. Uh, so Dr. Robert Iser is Fleet Coach's head of research, and he's uh, a road safety expert. So for more than 30 years now, Robert's actually helped drivers improve their safety record. He's a leader in the creation of evidence-based training approaches, um, and he's developed programs sponsored by the New Zealand government. And eDrive, his highly successful online training program for learner drivers, is actually part of the AA Defensive Driving Course in New Zealand. Um, Fleet Coach is the latest practical application of Robert's research, and it's constantly developing in line with the most recent recent research in the field. And as for me, I'm a registered psychologist with a background in health psychology, and I've been helping de develop driver training content for almost 10 years now. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the application of psychology to road safety. So this is very in line with, uh, with my particular interests. And for those of you that have noticed the similarity in the surnames, yes, Robert is my father. <laughs> um, so, what are we going to be talking about today? So we're talking about the connections between well-being, positive work culture, job satisfaction, and safe driving. Um, and we're particularly focusing today on the latest research into what really determines good health, well-being and safety of employees in organisations. Um, much, much research has revealed that psychological well-being does not only lead to good health, um, but also has other positive side effects and, you know, things that organisations really need to be aware of. Uh, this webinar is going to be for everyone who is interested in a positive work culture so that employees can flourish bringing their best versions of themselves to work, displaying resilience, um, and keeping themselves safe during challenging hazardous work and of course driving situations. So let's get into it. So hazard perception, this is something that Robert has talked about um, quite a lot. It's a term he uses often. Robert, can you, actually, can you tell us what hazard perception actually is? Yeah, so I've spent a lot of time actually researching hazard perception, um, realizing that hazard perception is actually the only skill that relates directly to crash risk. And I was always wondering why hazard perception is so important. You know, there might be other factors like being tired, you know, under influence of alcohol, um, um, you know, being stressed out at work. And, and all those factors that may affect driving, you know, as much as hazard perception. But then I realized that all those factors actually impact on hazard perception. You know, when you're tired, your hazard perception is slowed down uh, dramatically. So hazard perception is like the hub of all these other factors that are important for road safety. Right, and hazard perception involves specifically looking around you, spotting hazards. Yeah, it's hazard perception uh, is important because you know, it, when you are fast in perceiving hazard, then you have more time to manage risks. Mm, makes sense. Um, and so today we really want to add another layer to uh, all this discussion about hazard perception um, and talk about driving the way that we live and work. Um, 
and I believe we have a video here that illustrates this very well. So depending on the quality of your connection and Wi-Fi, um, this, the, yeah, yeah. The, the speed will vary, but Robert will narrate what. All right, so this is a video of a driver that we captured uh, in the far north, and this driver manages to make all the um, the driver errors that are almost possible, you know, driving too closely uh, now and now overtaking at a place where, you know, she really shouldn't be overtaking is a yellow line. And um, so the dangerous, dangerous driving, driving too fast and then almost crashing and have no control over whether there is a crash or not because um, the car just does appear. It's like Russian roulette, really, mm -hmm. and uh, really, really dangerous. And I think every one of us has um, experienced such situations. Mm -hmm. And then very often we respond very angrily, you know, almost a bit like uh, road rage. And um, and but there is a different way of looking at this because <clears throat> it's it's tempting, isn't it, to look at this and feel quite angry, um, or frustrated at that driver and sort of hope the worst for them and think that they need to learn their lesson and, and that sort of thing right yeah but there's an alternative way to, to approach this yeah instead of anger you know we could apply curiosity and actually try to uh, think you know what what is happening why is this um driver putting uh, himself and others uh, at danger and you know i believe that this person is in a very very psychologically in a very bad place uh, perhaps looks a bit like um, this driver here, <laughs> um, uh, really not a happy driver. And uh, you know why? Because perhaps uh, this driver experiences uh, a toxic work culture or has problems that the family is perhaps in a divorce or you know is, is experiencing um, lots of stress. And that um, very often expresses itself in uh, very unsafe driving. Right, so on face value we see a terrible driver, but actually there's probably a lot more going on. Um, and so you're mentioning sort of struggling at work. Um, how does that relate then to them potentially also struggling <laughs> to be safe on the road? Yeah, uh, when people struggle uh, at work, then there is no reason why they shouldn't also struggle when they drive. Mm. And struggle means you know, not being able to focus, reading the road in the wrong way, and having the, um, priorities that are not safe. So let's talk about um, a toxic work culture then, when, when work isn't, isn't working for you. Yeah, so there are quite a few indicators of a toxic work culture, you know. Um, at the moment, you know, it's, it's uh, in the media very often is bullying uh, because um, the 15 15 percent of all workers actually have experienced bullying at work, um, which of course uh, leaves uh, people uh, uh, totally distressed, uh, not feeling appreciated also from their colleagues or from the boss, uh, from the manager is also very often. And um, a sign of distress, overwhelmed with work, burned out, you know, when people really can't recover from the workload, uh, they might go away for two or three days, but feel exactly uh, as um, exhausted as before, mm -hmm. this kind of being burned out. These are all signs that actually uh, um, uh, um, are, are, are uh, signs of toxic work mm -hmm. and in fact there's a lot of research that says that um, not being supported by the people around you at work um, can actually lower your IQ and make you less rational in your decision making right and, and can even increase anxiety <clears throat> yeah absolutely uh, and physiologically you know it's it, it, there is lots of uh, different um, uh, symptoms you know it runs down your immune system uh, high level of cortisol uh, prolonged stress, of course, is very, very uh, dangerous uh, health-wise. You know, it clogs up your arteries and, you know, all sorts of uh, problems um, that would occur when you experience uh, long-term stress. Mm -hmm. And then we've got this this term of, um, we know what absenteeism is, but presenteeism, this idea of being there but not being there. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, an, an expression that I also uh, learned quite recently. Uh, presentism means you know that you are there um, with your body, but your mind actually is somewhere else. 
And uh, I think all of us have experienced that at one stage that you suddenly realize that uh, you're not actually as efficient as you could be. Mm. And so I guess what, what we're saying with all of this is that well-being isn't actually a luxury um, when, when it comes to productivity and um, efficiency and things like that, that, that well-being really needs to be part of um, the, the work culture, right? So if we this, this, these are all the signs of a toxic work culture. So how would you define a good, you know, a positive work culture? Yeah, <clears throat> positive work culture is when actually people feel really at ease at work and can perform to their um, best abilities. Uh, when the manager actually brings the best out of people, uh, also um, provides a lot of positive energy that is contagious. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and it's interesting in, in research, we talk a lot about psychological capital. They, um, have high levels of this capital that consists of four pathways to well-being. Um, and um, there is the acronym um, HERO, um, H for hope, which relates to the theory of hope, psychological theory of hope, which um, uh, promotes, you know, the agency and pathways and goals. You know, to have clear goals, what you want to achieve, the confidence that you actually can achieve what you want to achieve, and then the resilience if things um, go difficult or um, becoming it's getting tough, then you can still go on. Uh, resilience, of course, very important. Uh, optimism as well, as defini de defined by um, Seligman uh, on on a positive attitude into the future. Mm. So all of these things. Um... I mean, it sounds good, but would you say that they can be assessed and improved? Yeah, that's the beauty uh, of uh, psychological capital. It actually is a psychometric, these are psychometric measures that you can see uh, and measure. And then uh, for each pathway uh, to well-being, you can do an intervention and improve uh, those measures. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's quite a strong and powerful way of improving well-being in companies. So it's much less of a stab in the dark than people might yeah. think. You can, you can actually measure it and you can, you can do something about it. Yeah, and it's all evidence-based and the beauty is also that it directly relates to output, to uh, productivity uh, of companies. Mm -hmm. and, and so speaking of data then, can you talk about the relationship between safe driving and this this well person, someone with, with good life satisfaction. Can you talk about the connection between the two? Yeah, we did uh, quite a bit of uh, research at the university um, to uh, find correlations between life satisfaction and, and self-reported driver violations. And you can see on this slide, um, very high correlation. Actually, in, in the research, you know, we hardly find such uh, incredible correlation. When I saw this first time, I almost fell off the chair. I never <laughs> have seen this like before. And it's important because life satisfaction correlates with job satisfaction and uh, and 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 well-being measures. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is uh, really quite important. So that's actually brought me of this uh, uh, gave me this idea of um, people drive the way they live. Yeah. So we absolutely know without question that they're linked. Um, and, and can you talk more about, you mentioned a supportive work environment. Um, what, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, there is, um, you know, there are lots of research of, you know, how can we be more supportive uh, in, in a good, positive work environment. And um, you can also measure positive energy of employees um, and, you know, when um, managers actually put emphasis on collaboration rather than competition, uh, when managers actually appreciate people's work and don't overload people with um, this work uh, and, and put emphasis on social connection so that people actually feel connected and appreciated. Mm -hmm. So even in the workplace, it's important that, that people are able to be socially connected with one another. Um, it's not a case of just turning up to work 
doing a thing and going home again, but it matters. Yeah, I mean, it's not only at work. Loneliness is one of the biggest predictor of um, of unhappiness, mm -hmm. <laughs> of not feeling well, and it has actually also an effect on your body. Um, loneliness. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the uh, factors that uh, epigenetic uh, epigenetics showed that actually changes genes in your body when you are lonely and increases uh, the danger of uh, inflammation and also decreases immunity functions. Wow, okay. Um, and, and so a case study then of um, a supportive and positive work environment, a place that made some positive changes um, I believe there's, um, we've got a case study for about moving to a four day working week. Yeah, this is just one way, you know, we could actually change um, work culture quite around and it's a very innovative way. And you would think if you would um, decrease the number of days from five days to four days that um, your staff, your output would um, decrease at the same time mm. uh, and productivity. And it's actually not true, it's the opposite. You know, um, so there is a company, this perpetual guardian uh, company that actually took that risk and um, decreased the number of working days from five to four. And they realized that actually stress levels dropped from 45% to 38% mm. and um, and the output, the productivity actually increased rather than uh, decreased. And people were um, more committed to work, they were more stimulated, they were more empowered. And of course the work-life balance increased by 24%. So people had some free time to engage into really healthy um, hobbies and and ways with um, spending with the family. Wow, I mean that's quite impactful data, isn't it? Really? Yeah, and also that way of you know we say we should not work harder, we should work smarter, and mm -hmm. in a in a short time without getting stressed. Mm -hmm. And so, so if there are people out there thinking, what so what can actually be done in the workplace to make a difference? Um, can you talk a little bit about some specific? well-being interventions? Yeah, there are quite a, a few interventions um, that were uh, that are found to be effective. Um, for example, you know, creating space for being mindful, mindful and actually, you know, have, have some space where people can um, clear their mind and and uh, be mindful. And, and, and also um, very simple, you know, Doing good, being kind and supportive to colleagues increases uh, oxytocin, a hormone that is very, very healthy. It's not only good for being kind to other people, it's good for being kind for the person who is kind, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, doing good is very simple. It doesn't cost anything. Mm -hmm. Create positive emotions. Uh, for example, research showed that uh, it broadens cognitions and builds resources. Um, in positive psychology, um, Fredrickson has um, showed this very clearly that um, positive emotions is doing a lot of good things to people. Uh, every dollar spent on mental health will, you know, we get a 4.1 um, return. Um, so, so it actually is no, um, it's no brainer actually to put. Um, work into mental health improvements. Mm. And so when we so we often say that organisations have got a, an obligation under the, you know, particularly in New Zealand under the, the latest Health and Safety at Work Act from I think it's 2015. Um, so so what that should really say is it's under the safety, health and wellbeing yeah. areas. Absolutely, I would love to make a submission on that to add uh, well-being mm -hmm. uh, to uh, safety and health. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because we have to be aware, health is not um, is related to well-being, but it's not the same. Mm -hmm. You can be physically healthy, but not necessarily completely well. Exactly. As a person. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, okay, so so to sum up, it's something that's that's very important and not a luxury, and the data shows that it's not just good for the bottom line, but it's actually achievable through specific interventions. Um, I, I mean, that, that all sounds pretty optimistic, that it's measurable and something that you can improve. Yeah, and has 
so so many good effects you know it increases productivity output uh, the work environment is just more pleasant to go in there and it makes people safer whether at work um, you know lots of people do dangerous things at work including driving which is the most dangerous thing mm -hmm. for people to do and uh, it has a huge effect on that mm -hmm. All right, well, it sounds like that's probably our time up for today. Um, as Caroline mentioned at the beginning, if you've got any questions for Robert, um, please do send them through. Um, and so at this point, I guess we will hand back to Caroline. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Great. So our other speaker today is Ryan Rolston, the National Road Safety Manager at Fulton Hogan, who is providing um, a case study of what Fulton Hogan uh, has been doing, some of the things that they have in place to support employee well-being. Uh, Ryan couldn't um, be with us today, unfortunately, so we're sharing this case study which he recorded for us. Now, occasionally um, people do have a slight issue with hearing uh, videos through this software. So if that is the case um, for you and the audio isn't um, playing quite as well as it could, the full uh, video recording will be in the recording of this webinar um, spotlight session. So you'll be able to listen to the full version again um, in that recording. Hi, well, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, great to be here. I'm coming to you from Christchurch where it's turned into a beautiful day. And like Caroline said, um, I'm just looking to give a bit of a flavour for some of the things that Fulton Hogan's got in place to support wellbeing for its drivers. And just to put a bit of um, perspective into, um, into, into the risk, so Fulton Hogan has about 5,000 staff in New Zealand and about three and a half thousand um, light and heavy vehicles. It also travels about 100 million kilometres per year. And um, at, at that level of travel, um, I worked out it, it um, the level of exposure there equals, um, it's, it actually works out to be quite a significant amount of travel of the, a proportion of national travel. And within that, um, that means that just by sheer volume of travel that we're likely to be involved in um, road incidents or crashes. And to illustrate that, some of the incidents or crashes that uh, Fulton Hogan have been involved in in recent years, uh, a runaway truck um, on a work site which unfortunately collided with a worker. Um, a truck driver was um, driving through an intersection, uh, a pedestrian ran out in front of a uh, truck driver. A truck driver, um, a car went through an intersection and collided with a truck driver, which was unfortunately fatal. And quite recently, um, we had a truck pull over to the side of the road to take a photo, and it was, um, it was I'll call it, we could almost call this one a near miss, but it was an actual crash, but it was um, had a passing glance with a car that had veered to the to the shoulder of the road and a light truck was rear-ended by a heavy truck at quite significant speed. Um, they were looking to sort of temper speed through a roadwork site. So Fulton Hogan does get involved in a number of quite serious incidents um, and, and a lot of that is uh, down to just the sheer volume of traffic that uh, driving that we're involved in. And some of the points that I'd raise in that is um, uh, um, a lot of uh, our drivers, it's not necessarily their state of mind that can um, involve, uh, they can be in a really great state of mind and still um, bad things can happen. And um, so some of some of our support is really around mental wellbeing, is, our, is really around um, what happens after an incident as well as preventativeness. Some of the key things that I wanted to talk about today were uh, our Living and Safely Manual, our wellbeing resources, and our restart and safety days. So our Living Safety Manual, that is really a simplified version to encapsulate our entire health and safety system. And it focuses really strongly on our life-saving rules and critical risks. So again, this is really around um, trying to distill down quite carefully and simply what the key aspects of our business are that's really important to avoid um, the most serious consequences for our staff and our customers. And 
it recognizes the importance of health and well-being um, very at, at the highest level um, it, it recognizes um, the need to be um, drug and alcohol free when we're working as the, as the most critical risk um, but it also does recognize the importance of fatigue prescription medication drugs and alcohol stress and mental health and personal health and that's sort of so that's recognizing those aspects at the highest level of our health and safety system. The next element that I would like to talk about is our wellbeing resources. So because Fon Hogan is such a large organization, um, it's got uh, sort of a logistical issue with getting nationally or getting um, policies and procedures um, distributed right down to the grassroots level. And the way that we do that is um, we basically have nationally supported um, resources and we share those down with the team leaders at a regional level. And then the regional levels pick and choose and make um, those resources relevant to their specific business needs. And the sort of information that gets um, distributed from an from nationally downwards tends to be quite topical. So a really good example of that is COVID-19. So our national team has put together a pack of resources to support our regional teams um, with their response to COVID-19. And then the regional teams will take that pack of information and modify it and expand on it and make it relevant to their teams and distribute it. And it, in particular, our wellbeing resources, um, they're very strongly linked to the Mental Health Foundation's Five Ways to Wellbeing. So just on this slide, um, I've just provided some, there's a link and a bit more information and some really great resources available from this website that we, um, I guess, borrow heavily from. We also run an assistance um, employee program which is confidential essentially it's a, a counselling service um, that we make available for all our staff and listed there is just some of the I guess most common reasons why um, or some of the causes for people to pick up on on that particular service and another thing uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about which is a really effective way of uh, communicating some key information around well-being down to our staff is our restart and safety days. So our leadership team recognised that um, there were clusters of crashes at certain times of years and in particular around the new year and also in early spring when our construction activities really ramp up and so it's kind of like a start of season thing. So we have a really heavy focus um, on pulling our teams together at, at the start of the year and in early spring and we call that restart and safety days and so the idea is really um, to sort of start this key period um, it's kind of like start, starting the season with the right mindset and so those our days generally are a full day and that day will be split up into multiple sessions and those sessions can focus on um, I guess quite, um, I guess machinery orientated tasks, but they also, the sessions will definitely um, have, a, some sessions will definitely have a really strong fo focus on um, mental wellbeing. And so what often happens in a session is we'll have a video presentation. So that will be something that's often set up by our national team. Um, and the videos might go for only five or 10 minutes and they just give a really great representation and they're often dramatized by um, actors who come from Folden Hogan, um, sort of providing an example of the sorts of things that they could happen. And it just by doing that, it um, is a really consumable interact or not interactive, but engaging way. And it's um, made really relevant by people that you might know and within the organization. And we also borrow heavily on case studies, so either dramatization of what could happen, or in some cases, we actually use real events um, that might have happened in a different locality to give a really good understanding of the possible things that could happen. And just to cement 
um, the topic, we often it's often ended with a discussion to allow questions and and get a dialogue going between um, people within the region to get a, get an understanding of the field. And some good examples of sessions that were held in um, recent safety days is around states of error. So this is looking at um, um, the states of mind that you can be in that lead to an increased likelihood of an incident um, happening. And so those are around rushing, frustration, fatigue, and complacency. And we had a really great video on that um, and use and acted out with some examples to show um, what is the consequence of being in a state of mind that could lead to errors. And I think everybody sort of found that really relatable. Another really great one was a case study of a person who was um, in a really poor state of mind and one of his co-workers actually picked up on it and pulled it, uh, just sort of had a chat with him and um, it put, it, as it turned out, he sort of discovered that he was going through, he was in a really tough um, mindset and things really weren't looking good for him. And um, with the support of his coworker, he managed to, so they managed to really get a lot of support and it was a complete turnaround for, the, for this particular person. And um, it was just a really great way of, I guess, um, being able to show role modeling of supporting somebody, looking out for your mates and supporting some through somebody through a really tough um, situation. We've also had uh, situation uh, sessions on mindfulness and motivational speakers often um, play a role as well. And just um, looking at some of the some of the ways that um, that information is rolled out to our teams, I just pulled out some of these things that I think is really important to um, the success of, I guess, supporting workers' well-being. And, and I think the key one is culture. Um, and what I really mean by that is, it's quite a big thing to actually, for somebody to be, feel, um, to, to you need to be quite vulnerable to, I guess, to um, let people know that you're not in a, in a, in a, like a healthy state of mind. And, being able to do that is heavily dependent on having a high level of trust with, between your coworkers and having a team environment where it demonstrates or that creates that level of trust is really, really important for the ability for people to be able to talk freely about how they're feeling. The next one I'd like to talk about is accessibility. So um, the information has got to be accessible and um, it's, uh, not always easy if somebody um, if somebody at the coalface is struggling about where they can get information from and where they can turn to help. And it's really important that organisations make that information accessible in a way that's relevant to their staff, which leads on nicely to the next one. And these last three almost, or last next two are, are quite closely related, but it's, it's relevant and relatable. So, um, the information that we're sharing to support their well-being, it really has to be um, relevant to the types of situations that they could be exposed to. And um, making it relatable, so by using things like um, videos or examples that involve perhaps um, a close co-worker or, or somebody who they can relate to, um, really helps strengthen the message and allows the messages to be, um, I guess, sink in. And timely is really important as well. So um, I mentioned around the timing of our the, um, our clusters of crashes around the new year and around our construction timeframe. Um, and COVID is, is another example that um, you, you need to be quite nimble in terms of getting the information right down to the grassroots where it's needed at the right time. So hopefully that's, um, a helpful summary of where things are at for, and some of the things that Fold and Hogan have been doing in the in the um, mental health state. Um, I'll pass back to you, Carolyn. Great, hopefully uh, that case study was useful and interesting to um, you all as well. If you have got any questions specifically for Ryan, we can put those to him uh, following this session, so you, you're welcome to still send those through. Um, and also we'll uh, just bring Robert and Nadine back online 
now because it's time for our Q&A session. So if you have, again, got any uh, questions to ask the speakers, please do put them through uh, using the question function on your control panel and we'll pose them. I uh, will just double check we can still hear Robert and Nadine. Ah, yes. Yes, we are still here. Great. It's great to still have you here. So um, whilst we see if uh, people put some questions through, I, I, we've got a couple already for you. Um, so first one, um, you mentioned a positive psychology. Can you explain a little bit more about what positive psychology is? Sure. Uh, positive psychology is actually a relatively new area in psychology and it focuses on strength and resilience and um, doing lots of research on well-being interventions. So the, the aim of positive psychology is um, to make uh, individuals um, um, perform better, uh, flourish and um, being the best they can be. And, <clears throat> and also um, you know, make sure that co uh, communities and organizations thrive and um, be the best they can be. So rather than focusing on deficiencies and pathologies and things like that, it's about how people can, can flourish, right? which is so relevant to this whole driving conversation because it's not just about the punitive, what people have done wrong and, and, and what they're lacking, but actually what we what can be done to help, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's not, uh, we always, or many people think, you know, when you get rid of a deficit, then it automatically becomes a positive or a, a, a strength, but it's actually not true. Uh, um, creating strengths needs a lot of effort. Uh, positive emotions don't come automatically. They have to be worked on. <clears throat> and um, in order to cancel out negative emotions, for example. So that's what positive psychology as aim is. Great, thanks for that explanation. That's really helpful. Um, and also you talked about some interventions and also uh, Ryan in his case study talked about some of the interventions that, and measures that they've put in place too. But how much do these all need to cost? How does budget come into it? Um, and how do organizations allow for that? Yeah, it really doesn't have to be expensive, you know, and very often organizations uh, have the idea that, you know, we have to get the, the business going first and then we look at the sort of luxury of well-being at the end. It sort of always comes at the end of the to-do list. Uh, is also look at well-being of, 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 of the people. But uh, I believe it should, uh, the priority should be there right at the start. Um, of, of the organization, it should be high up in the priority list. And uh, it's, it doesn't have to be um, expensive, you know, to be kind and creating a positive work culture. Uh, it's something that the manager um, can achieve with very, very little budget. Uh, sometimes perhaps it needs a little bit of a, um, of a consultant that comes in, an organizational psychologist who actually perhaps creates some uh, workshops and helps the manager to to create a positive uh, environment. And, and I suppose what you said before is really relevant too, right? That, that the return, that, that even you know, even if there is a bit of an investment that is made, um, the return is is so demonstrated that you really can can sort of rely on that happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 incredible, actually, what well-being in a company does to the output, uh, to the to the to the profit of the organization that most people are, of course, um, uh, interested in. And of course, relating back to driving, yeah, the amount of money that's directly saved if people aren't having to do incident reports and repair fleet vehicles, and of course, the health cost and all these things, yeah, very measurable as well. Yeah, the cost of crashes uh, in organizations is immense. You know, if that can be avoided by um, by by putting emphasis on well-being, isn't that isn't that a great thing to do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and relating to, you've had a question through um, around the drivers themselves, and have, do you have any? practical tips for individuals who drive for work every day that they could use to help 
um, help to recognise their own well-being to manage their safety on the road? Yeah, there are quite a few uh, well-being interventions for, for individuals. Uh, we, for example, um, did uh, research on uh, mindfulness um, that seems to be very, very effective and people are more mindful when they drive. Um, uh, and, and perhaps, you know, focus really on the driving rather than, you know, have their mind on all over uh, on, on different, um, di uh, di different issues they are working on and perhaps reserve that time um, to, to enjoy the ride rather than to stress about what's coming next and what happened in the past and what might happen in the future. Because the future is um, perhaps not happening, it's perhaps an illusion anyway, and the past is the past, it's gone, we can't, do, we can't change the past anyway. So why not actually focus on the present and, uh, and really uh, be there? Uh, and uh, enjoy and have a rest uh, in a way of, of stress before work continues. And I guess also, you know, as part of that question, I think the term was awareness that, that you know, the individual person needs to be aware of what their state is like before they pop behind the wheel, right? And knowing how tired they are, how stressed they are, how well they are, uh, might become part of an everyday check a chicken with yourself before you drive yes and have different ways of 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 intervening you know um, you know being tired is certainly not a good way of um, of, of driving um, and um, yeah doing all um, these interventions yeah that's great okay what uh, one final question is um uh, is there evidence that younger people, um, and this would be uh, relevant to both younger people in, uh, who are driving in the workforce and also uh, younger people more, more generally, whether they are better or worse at hazard um, perception, hazard identification whilst driving? Yeah, um, young people are not famous for good hazard perception, that's mm -hmm. for sure, mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, risk management, but, uh, you know, um, Bad has a perception, or you know, leads to to risky driving because people don't realize you know what the hazards are, and then take more risks or risks than they shouldn't take. Um, yeah, and particularly for young people, uh, has a perception training is very very uh, helpful. Uh, it's probably one of the best interventions they can do. Great, so for fleets that have got young drivers, if they actually uh, implement some hazard perception training, that could help with those um, younger people to be, get more experienced and better at hazard identification, yes? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah. No, that's that's true. Great, thank you both. That's, those are some really um, useful practical tips for people as well, so uh, really appreciate your time on that and I know we've run a, a little bit over time but it was great to, to have those questions through um, from all of you tuning in so thanks very much for participating in the Q&A session as well. So just to very quickly wrap up um, before we finish to let you know about a couple of other forthcoming events and activities that we've got our next webinars are on managing driver speed on Wednesday the 5th of May and that's linked to National Road Safety Week as well and on tackling drug driving in July. You can find the full schedule for the year, including UK webinars uh, on the Global Fleet Champions website. And if you can't make a particular webinar or it's not running in your time zone, but you're still interested, it's worth signing up because you'll be sent the link to the recording afterwards as well. And this year we're also running some virtual roundtables. These are in-depth discussions with around 15 participants on specific fleet topics. We're looking for a broad range of industry representatives to participate. So if you're interested in being part of one of these, please get in contact with us. We've also got our Fleet Champions Awards open for entries. So if you've put measures in place to successfully help reduce your road risk, please do consider applying. And if you know someone else who should apply, please pass the details on or nominate them for an award as well. And Road Safety Week, um, which I mentioned earlier, is a great opportunity to raise awareness of road safety with your staff. And this year, the week takes place the 17th to the 23rd 
of May. Um, this is also the UN Global Road Safety Week and the theme is speed, the same as the Global Week. You can sign up and access free activity ideas and resources by completing the form on the Road Safety Week website. And you can also use these resources at any time during the year as well, not just Road Safety Week. So it's a, an easy way to get involved in something, raise awareness and help to build that road safety um, culture. And you could uh, link in some wellbeing activities around that too. And if you're interested in working with us more and supporting our work, there are lots of ways you can do this. Um, we have corporate partnership and sponsorship opportunities available. There are lots of ways to fundraise to support our work or you can make an individual donation. This year is Break's 10th birthday and we'll have some special activities and fundraising events. Um, and as a charity, we really value your support. So if you want to know more about working with us, please get in touch. Um, and your support helps us to provide free support to families bereaved in road crashes and also to continue, continue providing free road safety information and advice as well. So we really appreciate it. So I hope you found today's webinar useful and interesting. Please do fill in the feedback survey when you leave the webinar. It's really useful for us uh, in helping to plan future events. Thank you again to our sponsors, Fleet Coach, and to our speakers today. And finally, thank you for taking part. We hope to see you at another webinar again soon.